when I was a youth pastor, I took a group of high school senior guys right after they graduated out to a camping trip that they had set up. There were five of these young guys, and I took them on out. We headed to the Rocky Mountains, into the the mountains of Colorado. And when we got there, it was a little bit uh, about the middle of June, I think, is when the trip took place. And the ranger at the station told us that the site where we were headed had still not fully thawed out. It was pretty snowy up there from the winter. They had a lot of snow that winter. But we were pretty stubborn, and we were uh, pretty adventurous guys, so we said we're going forward anyway, and we headed up the canyon to get to our site. Well, after the first couple of miles, we trudged through first ankle-deep, and then eventually knee-deep, and then waist-deep snow, and we were each too stubborn to say anything about it and turn back. No one wanted to be the first one to say, uh, guys... <laughs> When we arrived at the site, uh, we never found the actual site, but it was near a lake up there in the high mountains. And we dug the snow down enough that we could set our tents on firm ground. But it quickly became apparent that the snow was the least of our problems because as we started setting up the tents, the wind came just whipping across that lake. And it was tearing the tent out of our hands, it was bending the poles. Eventually, uh, we did get the tents up, we got inside, hunkered down where we would stay for three days. We, didn't leave, we, didn't, we barely stepped outside of the tent. And over the course of that time, the wind continued to come across the lake and batter the tents. I remember early on, the first evening, they're all looking to me. I'm the oldest guy, I'm the most experienced guy in the group by just a few years. And they're asking, when's the wind going to stop? And I remember saying, you know, eventually the sky will run out of wind and it will, it will die down. It, was, it just kept coming. Well, I was wrong. The sky had plenty of wind. It just barraged us night and day. By the time that we decided to come back off of that mountain, all of the poles of our tents had been snapped. Multiple rips in the seams So much, in fact, that the final night that we slept out there, it was basically like we were wrapped in a tarp because the tent had just been wrapped around us, just flapping all night long. After coming down, it wasn't until we were almost down off that mountain that people started loosening up and deciding, now we can complain. It's okay because we're almost to the car (laughs) and we discussed it. And I remember from that day thinking that I had found a new definition for the word relentless. That wind was relentless. When I hear that word today, I imagine that wind that never stopped day or night. Now, I suspect that you might have a definition for the word relentless. Maybe you've been in experiences and seasons where something hit you, barraged you, like that wind across the lake, and it didn't ever seemed to stop. There was no end to it. It was a relentless barrage. You know, I think that each of us knows that we're going to have to endure challenging seasons. We're going to have to endure the storms, the winds. We're going to have to go through that. We even call them seasons because we expect there's a start and an end, just like the seasons of the year come and go, come and go. Eventually, it'll come to the end. But if you've ever been in a period of time, in a season that was so prolonged, you wondered, will this ever end? Is there a stop to this? You certainly face the kind of challenge that the Word tries to prepare us for. When seasons of hardship persist beyond what you thought that they would, you must endure. But how are you to? What are we to do to make sure that we can persist? Today, I want to scratch the surface of this idea and this question from the text that we're reading through in John. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to John chapter 6. I'm going to read through just the few verses we'll cover today, verses 16 through 21. I'll pray, and then we'll back up, go back through a verse or two at a time. And I'll just a couple of points of application by the time we get to the end of our time today. So let's read, and then I'll pray. John 6, starting in verse 16. 
When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Let's pray. Father, these few short verses we'll read through today tell us of a very significant story, an event that actually happened, took place on the Sea of Galilee during the days of Jesus' ministry. Lord, I'm thankful that John, who was present for this miracle, wrote these things down. I'm grateful that your Holy Spirit guided that to happen so that it would be without error and so that we could have it today to read and to learn from. Father, I pray that the application today will be in line with what your intention was as to why this was here. Father, please please help me to be true, clear, and helpful for those who are here. And Lord, teach us to trust in you more fully as a result of this sermon. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, a quick backstory to what's going on kind of sets us uh, up to see where we were regionally and what was just taking place. A few hours before this story kicks off was the story that we covered last week of Jesus feeding the 5,000 men. That's where they're out in the the wilderness. They're all sitting on on a hillside, and uh, there's a whole group of people, thousands. We said last week the count was 5,000 men. It's very likely... uh, Matthew even says that there was also women and children that weren't part of that count. So there there were thousands and thousands, maybe 10, 15, maybe more, thousand people out there on this hillside. And Jesus miraculously feeds all thousands of these people with a tiny lunch of a few loaves and fish. And he provided so thoroughly that after this entire miracle was complete... The disciples, all 12 of them, picked up a basketful each of provisions, of leftovers, if you will, from that particular miracle. And this is what happens next. Look at verse 16. When evening came, again, that's the same day. When evening came, it was starting to get dark in the last passage. Now night has fallen. His disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. After the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus, the other gospel authors will tell us, he goes up onto the mountain alone to pray. That's why he originally went out into the wild to bring the disciples with him. And so now he's going out even further. He's saying, listen, you go down to the boats. He instructs them to go paddle across to Capernaum, which is kind of their base of operations in Galilee, as he heads up to spend some time alone that evening. They were simply obeying Jesus. I couldn't help but think about this as I, as I read through texts and prepare to preach on them. I'm asking questions all the time. And one of the questions I ask all the time is, why, why, why? I sound like my, my two-year-old, why, why, why? Every time I'm reading through texts. And I saw these disciples go down to the sea. It's nighttime. It's dark, we're going to see. And they start to row to town. It's only a few miles away from where they would have been, but they had to row out into the sea and then across in order to get to where Capernaum was. Why would they do this? Well, the answer is not explicitly given. Why not just wait till the morning? Why did you have to get into the boat in the middle of the night? Why not go with Jesus? All we know is that Jesus told them to. We don't get that in John. We hear that from the other gospel authors. But simply, when a man miraculously multiplies a little lunch to feed thousands gives you enough leftover to take a basket full with you, also instructs you to do something else, you don't question them. You just do it. You just go. So these disciples make their way down to the beach, get in the boat, and they head out into the sea. Verse 18 tells us what happens next. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing the seas. Because a strong wind had come across That lake of Tiberias, that sea of Galilee, it came across, it caused the storm to rage, it caused the waves to rise, and the sea was rough. Now, uh, the wind in the Bible is often used as a symbol for random, 
uncontrolled events. This is symbolic for uh, the circumstances that are unpredictable, occurrences that we have no control over as humans. Now, the sea began to get rough. Now, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, on Christmas Eve, I preached a sermon on Jesus' calming of the sea. It was the very same sea. It was the very same disciples. It might have even been the same boat that they were in, quite honestly. But it was a different event. Now, during that sermon, I pointed out how the Word regularly uses this imagery of the sea to represent chaos and destruction. And so, at a risk of rehashing a whole portion of that sermon, I just want to very quickly remind you of this because I do think that it's worth repeating. The sea in Scripture is a place of disorder, a place of mayhem. It's a place of death. It's a place where forces beyond our control are at play. In fact, when a person is in the sea, they are at the mercy of the waves. We see this all the time in the Bible. Man can't control the sea. He's under control by the sea. He's at the mercy of the wind and waves. It's a place of death and demons. Daniel chapter 7 describes uh, the demonic forces behind governmental powers and the biggest empires in the world. And all of them came from the sea in his vision. In the end of the Bible, in Revelation 10 and 13, the angel who kind of opens up the end times, he stands with one foot in the sea and one in the land, kind of spanning a bridge between chaos and order that will finally conclude human affairs. In chapter 13 of Revelation, the beast, the final great arch enemy of God on earth, comes out of the sea in order to continue his work. In the Bible, when God protects his people, he does so through the sea. He protects them from from the destructive powers of the waters, like the people in the days of the Exodus through the sea, untouched. Uh, Noah and the ark were on the sea that destroyed everything else, but God protected them. We're reminded by Jonah. Do you you remember about the story of Jonah, what happened there? When, When Jonah was on the boat trying to get away from God's mission for him, when the seas got rough, what was it? that the non-Jewish, non-believing people on the boat assumed. They said, this must be the spiritual work of some being, and someone on this boat must be accursed. That's why this is going down. And what did they do to Jonah when they figured out he was the one? Reluctantly at first, but eventually they threw him out, the cursed man, into the cursed sea. In Acts chapter 17, Paul is on his way to to the, the big goal of his missionary purpose in the first few missionary journeys was to swim culturally upstream to get to kings and palaces and the greatest influences and eventually Rome, the seat of all the influence in that area. And while he's on the way there, he's on a boat, and what happens? He gets in a big turmoil in the sea. And God sends an angel to say, I will protect you. I will watch over you in the sea. Just do what I say. Stay on the boat. You and everyone else will survive. God protects his people from that kind of chaos. Guys, even Christian baptism, even Christian baptism points to this a bit. Because the primary illustration that baptism is supposed to be for us is us being buried into death. And then raised to new life. What's the death? The water buried into the chaos and the destruction of that finality, that death. We come up out of it. That's the whole image that we see constantly pointed to with Christian baptism. Even in the end, in the end times, in Revelation 18, God will once and for all take this great, awful city Babylon that is this illustration, this symbol for all the wicked works and intentions of mankind. And he will throw it into the sea. Jesus even warns people that if you lead little ones astray, it'll be better for you to have been thrown into the sea, a millstone tied around your neck, a place of death. In chapter 20 and 21 of Revelation, closing chapters of the Bible, the last few, not only does he say that the sea finally gives up its dead for judgment, but in the new heavens and the new earth, there will be no sea, no more chaos, no more destruction, all that will be resolved. And so in the Gospels, the fact that Jesus has absolute authority over the sea is not only literally significant, because he did, disclaimer, he did literally calm the sea. 
All these events I just described, they literally happened. I'm not saying they were symbol. They were only symbols. People actually were rescued through and from the sea. Jesus walked on the sea. Jesus calmed the sea. But that was also highly, highly spiritually symbolic. So that's the sea. When you're in your personal Bible time this year, and whatever course you're reading through, Keep your eye open for water and sea. And I think you'll see this over and over and over again. How God demonstrates his authority and power by his ability to calm and to manage and to protect in the face of the sea. Verse 19, let's continue on. Sea's rough. We can imagine that there's fear. Other gospels will say they are afraid. It's rough because the strong wind was blowing. And verse 19 says this. When they had rowed about three or four miles... They saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. Now, unsurprisingly, the disciples are frightened by seeing Jesus. First, we know they're frightened by the storm. Then they are frightened by the sight of a man walking on the waves. I think it's a ghost at first, until they realize in the next verse it actually is, in fact, Jesus. Now, John makes this note that they are three or four miles offshore. They've already traveled a bit. It's not that they're trying to you know, get past the headwaters and get out. It's not that they're almost to their destination. Three or four miles out, they're in a precarious place, and it's at the worst point of their journey, we can surmise, as Jesus finally arrives. They must have been exhausted. Three or four miles of that rowing in heavy storms, in the dark, must have been an exhausting journey. It was a very real hardship for them. It wasn't fun. It was not enjoyable. It produced very real fear, very real concern, very real anxieties. Probably someone got a few more white hairs or hair fell out after this kind of thing, this kind of harrowing journey. It was not pleasurable. It was a miserable experience for the disciples, but not for Jesus. Jesus walked three or four miles worth on the water. How long does it take you to walk three or four miles? 30, 40, 50 minutes, depending on your pace, 50 minutes. Jesus didn't do a quick hop, skip across a couple of puddles. He pursued them all the way across miles of this water. And simply for Jesus, he's just taking a stroll. I want you to think about that for a minute. Here's Jesus. Here's the disciples. The disciples are just battling, sweating, dripping with water and sweat and fear on their faces. And here's Jesus, just walking. Your greatest challenges in life are a walk in the park for Jesus. They're easy for him. They're simple for him. You're not asking for a co-laborer. When you pray to God, When you pray for Christ's help, you're not asking him to come down under the burden and go, okay, on the count of three, one, two, three, and he's grunting with you to lift the burden that you have. Jesus' ministry on earth where he would sweat and cry and bleed, that ministry is done. He is now equipped and given all authority and power over everything that exists. There is no challenge that Jesus will confront that is difficult for him. So this passage here, I think, is to show us that Jesus is unfazed by storms. He's not bugged by this. He's not worried by this. He doesn't share in their anxieties. They were frightened. He was not. He's unruffled and calm. Verse 20 and 21. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. So he tells them, it's I, don't be afraid. Oh, good, get in the boat. They're glad. Please get in here with us. They're glad to do that. And then interesting note, the boat was, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Whether that just means that like, whoa, it it was supernatural, like he just zapped into there, or perhaps it's just quite simply that because the, the calm happened immediately, which we know from other texts, it was... The route was easy, bam, that was all they needed. Then they arrived. And that's the end of the story. 
Now, this is interesting because very often in the Gospel of John, when he records significant miracles, he provides commentary on it. He repeats it or says it again or explains some teaching that Jesus offers about that specific event immediately after. So John tells us of a significant miracle and then unpacks it a bit. But regarding this particular one, this is all we get. John's done. He won't ever mention this again. And not only that, but we know some of the other really Incredible things that take place as a part of this, John doesn't even care to mention. Peter walked on the water with Jesus at this exact event. John doesn't care to mention. Jesus, as soon as he gets in the boat, the storm is done. Literally, peace, calm happens. But here, John doesn't even mention it. But why? Why does John include such little detail in this particular story here? There are many of the Events that take place in the other gospel accounts that John just doesn't add. Well, those are already written. I'm not going to add to that. And yet he puts this here. Why? Well, I just want to give you the cheat code from John chapter 20, 30 through 31. And I brought this up in every other sermon through John. I think it really matters. He writes this. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So this, in some measure, accomplishes that. This needed to be there so that we would be able to be aided in our belief in Jesus. As always, John wants you to believe in his perfect Savior. Whether or not you get all the details of the event, it's not John's purpose. He's not trying to train future historians. He's building up believers. And so that's what this accomplishes. Now think with me, the proximity with the other event, the feeding of the 5,000. And think about last week. I I said this last week as, as a major point of application from last week. Could the disciples come up with the solution on their own to feeding the hungry people? No. Could they just miraculously uh, pray or, or Jesus just snap his fingers or do something that would just miraculously fill bellies? Like, wh- why have to provide bread at all? Just go, boom, they will not be hungry for a week. Why that? And the answer that I drew out last week was that Jesus was teaching them to trust in him, teaching his disciples to trust in him to provide for all of the needs of those who come to him. And if needs be, which is certainly the case, to come back over and over again to get refilled and to give out again. To summarize, when you lack what is needed, go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. Go back to Jesus. Go back to Jesus. They went out, distributed bread, came back. They went out, distributed bread, came back. And every time they came back to Jesus, Jesus never hit empty and was like, oh, that's all I got. Tell the last thousand they can go away. He had surplus. They all ate their fill, and they came back and back and back until there was leftovers, right? When you lack what is needed, go to Jesus. But what do you do if you don't have the strength To go to Jesus. And the answer is, he comes to you. So here are these disciples. They just learned this amazing lesson. Oh, man, this guy will give us everything we need. We just keep going back to him. Bread, fish, teaching, healing, whatever we need, we go get it. And now they're separated from him. By whose design? By Jesus' design. Go ahead of me. I'll catch up. I'm going to the mountain. You get on the boat. Okay, Lord. They get on the boat. They're out in the, they're out in the water. If any one of them decided to take on that moment to be, the, to be the small group leader, to shepherd the crew. Okay, hold on, hold on. We just learned this from our Savior. We just learned this from our friend Jesus. If we need him, go to him. He'll take care of us. And they're like, we're trying. 
How, how can we? No amount of effort that the disciples could have offered on the hillside with hungry crowds could have produced the food to feed them. No amount of effort could have done it. No amount of effort while they're in the sea paddling away could have gotten them to Jesus. So what do you do? He comes to you. I think, I think that's the point of the story. I think that's why John includes this here. And I think that'll be further clarified in upcoming weeks as we see Jesus explain the meaning and the intention behind him providing the bread for the people. We'll get there in upcoming weeks. Here's what I want to do with you in our remaining time. Building upon this, I want to offer up a few application points for you. And I'm going to start by just asking this question, and I'm going to ask it with the presupposition that you know the answer. And I'm going to say that because you know the answer. You know the answer to this one. If you're a believer today, you know the answer to this question. It's not a trick one. What would be the entire purpose of the lives of these disciples until they die, till the rest of their days? What was their entire highest cause, challenge, commission? They were to multiply it. To make disciples. They're to glorify God, bring Him glory, make great His name. How? By doing exactly what He said to go do. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. They're to baptize, they're to teach. That's their goal build the kingdom of God. They have the same great commission as you and I. They got it firsthand, we got it through them. And what should be expected? in the pursuit of that end. Peace and prosperity, a world that is without harm or hostility towards our message, uh, maybe amicable and receptive to our gospel. No, Jesus even promised the opposite of that reception. In Matthew chapter 10, he told these same disciples, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Later in that chapter, he says, do not think I've come to bring peace to the earth. I have come to bring not peace, but a sword. He sent them out into the sea of furious enemy resistance. Remember when Jesus even says, one of our favorite verses, I bring it up here all the time. Uh, Matthew 16, Jesus talks to the disciples about the, 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 the foundation for their faith and what he's going to build upon. And he says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The greatest forces our enemy can amass will be present, will be active, but they will not succeed. He sent his disciples out into a sea of enemy resistance, suffering out out into trials and hardships, seasons where the wind would relentlessly pound against them. The kind of sea where a couple of winds will knock them down, they go, oh, that was pretty bad, but it's probably done now. Nope, and keeps coming, and keeps coming. I have to suspect there's at least one optimist in that boat going, it's probably almost over. (laughs) And then when that doesn't happen, oh, here we go. You said. No, the wind was going to keep coming until the storm was finished. Jesus did not promise all of our seas would be calm. He promised that he would be with us even to the end of the age. More than that, there is nothing that Jesus will ever ask of us that he will not also supply what we need to accomplish that mission. If he tells you to feed 5,000, he will multiply whatever little you come up with so you can feed the 5,000. If he tells you to row across an inland sea in the middle of the night in a storm, he'll make sure you get there. Whatever he tells us to go do, Whatever the intent and purpose behind that command, he will supply the needs to get there. You know, I'm just thinking super practically on this one right now because I'm thinking about our new church building and I'm thinking about the needs to get there. There are a thousand checkboxes that have to be checked off before we can get into that space. Permit or not, inspection stuff with the city, uh, all the people to line up just right and in time. We're a huge deficit of funds to get there. There's just so many things that can go wrong in a project like this, 
We're far from the end. It's not a foregone, bygone conclusion, right? It's not, not finished. We have plenty more still to do to get there. But I just need you to hear from me. I am absolutely certain about the mission that God has for us, which is to build healthy churches that stand the test of time, that endure to another generation, that multiply other healthy churches and pour into and encourage other healthy churches. I'm utterly and absolutely convinced of that. And I am also quite confident that securing buildings will be an enormous support to that mission. Does that make sense? So I am not saying that sticks and bricks are the mission. They're not. But I do believe that they are an incredibly critical scaffolding to the mission being built. They'll be utilized by God in enormous ways in order to continue to advance the kingdom in this place. And so... If I'm right about that part, I don't doubt for a second that I'm right about the big picture mission, but if I'm right about the part of getting into a building as a, as a mini something for us in this season, then nothing can stop us from getting there. The Lord will provide. We may have to row three to four miles in the dark, in the storm, but if I'm right about that, then it's inevitable. Now, you might ask, but why? So what I'm hearing you say, Rich, and it makes sense. We're going to go through hardships. Okay, there's going to be hardships. There's going to be seasons. It's difficult. There will be times that the wind knocks you over a couple times, and then it keeps coming and keeps coming. Okay. You get it in your mind. Many of you, I suspect, actually have practical experiences you can draw upon. You go, oh, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Maybe right now. Some of you are feeling it even more. You're going, I know exactly what you're talking about. But why? Why do we have to face the storm at all? Why not just have peaceful seas all the time? Wouldn't that be better? And the answer to that question is that the storms have purpose. The storms have meaning. They're there for something. They're being used for something. So here's the pop quiz. By whom? Who controls the weather? God controls the weather. Let me read a few verses for you. Psalm 135, 6 through 7. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the deeps. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain and brings forth the wind from his storehouses. There is nothing random about weather. What seems like chance to us is purposeful to God. God's never watching down and going, oh, what do you know? Lightning struck that tree. No. Psalm 65, 5 through 7. By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness, O God, of our salvation. The hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. He's everywhere, I'm telling you. The one who by his strength established the mountains being girded with might, who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples. Can't help it. You can see there again, seas are more than just water. The tumults of the peoples. It's this place of chaos and destruction. And who stills them? The roaring of the seas? Our God of salvation. We experience all kinds of storms in our lives, and they can be terrifying. They can be miserable. They can be even exhausting. Some storms even wound us. Some storms, after they're finally gone, leave scars. But he sends those storms for a reason. They have a purpose. Hosea 6.1 says this, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. Even your most miserable seasons are being used by God, are purposed by God to shape you, to sanctify you. If you're not 
familiar with the things I'm talking about for yourself. If you haven't ever endured those kind of seasons that are just, oh my goodness, is this going to end? Perhaps at least you've seen this with others. And this is something that, as believers, we constantly need to be encouraged about when it comes to providing counsel for others around us. It's, it's counseling is discipling others who go through hard times. So you've got a brother or a sister who's going through a really hard season, a really hard struggle. They're getting knocked down by the winds. They're hitting the turmoil of the seas, and it just keeps going on. Now, oftentimes, because of our love for one another, when one suffers, all suffer. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. These are beautiful truths. Because of that, oftentimes, believers come around, and you may have felt this before. You're just so eager to help. You want to do something, but good, but you need to remember at least a couple of things. And first, is, first and foremost is this. If you ever come upon a brother or sister who's going through one of those rough sea seasons, the first thing you must remember is you can't calm that storm for them. You can't do it. You can't. You're not their Messiah. They have one. It's not you. I say that and I pause because I've seen and watched so many times our love and and our love for the word drives us to want to help. Praise be to God. But this has to be in mind. I want you to imagine for a second, these disciples that were in the boat, all of them had performed miracles already. They'd cast out demons. They'd healed the sick. Jesus already gave them authority to do this, chapters earlier in some of the other uh, gospel accounts. He sent them out, gave them authority over unclean spirits, cast out demons, heal infirmities. These guys had literally prayed over, laid hands on people, and miracles took place. And none of them could calm the storm. None of them could stand up. I got this. Storm, stop. Even if they tried... They were incapable. This is why Jesus doesn't show up and go, hey, why didn't you just do that thing I taught you? Why didn't you just rebuke the storm? Oh, because you have not been given authority over the storms. He had the authority, not them. You and I cannot be. We are not messiahs. And so we can't provide the calm through storms that others would want. We can't do it for ourselves. We can't do it for others. And so, guys, I see this all the time when I get to go as a pastor and be there with people and pray with people. And ah, this, this turmoil, this my marital conflict is just killing me. My, I, I, I can't sleep. It's all, it's all consuming. It feels like everything's falling apart. My, my teenage kid is going wayward. They're growing up, becoming young man, young woman, and they're making all the wrong decisions, and they're sprinting away from Christ and towards a cliff, and there's nothing I can do about it. Christian brother, Pastor Rich, uh, my, my life is falling apart. Material possessions are all fading away. And going, I, I don't even know how I'm going to pay the bills. Guys, it's heartbreaking to watch. It's heartbreaking to watch those things take place with somebody else, and it compels us to want to help. And I think we're supposed to want to help. But it's not our job to calm storms. It's our job to call out to the one who calms the storms. Our job to call out to Jesus. Get in the boat with us, please. First, you're not the Messiah. I'm not the Messiah. We don't calm the storms. We need Jesus to calm them. Second, second, even if you could calm that storm for another person or yourself, even if you could, that storm is being used by God for the good of his people. He's sanctifying us through it. He's shaping us. He's making us more like his perfect son through those things. And we ought not wish them away. You know, I remember shortly after our oldest daughter, uh, Bethany, was born, my wife and I uh, began a, a fresh prayer regimen for her. You know, we had been praying all throughout the pregnancy, and, uh, and the, the biggest prayer throughout the pregnancy was salvation for that unborn child, and that that unborn child would be born healthy. Those are the, the two biggest prayers. And now that we're holding this little one, and we're just thanking the Lord, thank you for a healthy birth, Lord. Thank you for that. And now the next prayers became all the things we're imagining. This little kid's going to grow up. 
and experience in life. And we were very tempted to pray that nothing bad would ever happen. And I remember distinctly one night almost letting those words come off my lips, and it was like a, a bolt of lightning. I was like, whoa, 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 no, 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 no. No, Lord. Because I know that the most painful and challenging experiences of my life have been used by you to make me love you and trust you more. And I want that for my children more than anything. Lord, my prayers change from that point. Don't help them avoid all the pain that you might use. But whatever they face, use those things for your glory and for their joy. When we go through storms, we cry out to God. We oftentimes ask for the storm to stop. I want to say, I think that's a totally appropriate and right prayer. I think that's good to ask that. Lord, this is hard. Please bring it to an end. Father, this cancer is terrible. Please, please heal this person. Father, this season of horror that my brother or sister is going through is so bad. Please bring it to an end. Conclude this. Somehow, Lord, pray those things. Do that. But when he doesn't answer that prayer in the way that you're hoping, when he doesn't finish the disease and shut it down and heal the person, when he doesn't remove that burden from that person, when he doesn't immediately provide the kinds of things that you've been praying for, and you ask, why? If the storm carries on, you can be sure it is just not yet finished its work. You can be sure of that. It's not that he forgot. Because I confess, there are times that uh, I got two battling kids, you know, arguing, and I send one to time out, 45 minutes goes by, I'm like, oh, goodness, I forgot. Laura comes in, hey, what happened to that kid? I go, oh, oh, yeah, uh, I was giving them an extra long time out. You forgot, didn't you? Yeah, I did, I totally forgot. It was nice and quiet for a while. That never happens with our perfect father. He never goes, oh, my goodness, the storm is still raging there? Oh, uh, giving them some extra blessings in this next season for that. No? No? I know, I know it's still going. It's not that he's trying, but unable. It's not Jesus standing on the shore and looking out and seeing his disciples out there. Mark says that. He says that he saw them struggling. Imagine him being up on the mountaintop. He's there praying, just spending some time alone. He can see out in the darkness this little boat and rocking. He can tell. This is, yep, he knows. He's not obtuse. He's not so limited in his knowledge that he goes, are they struggling? They, they got it. He knows. And it's not as though he stands on the shore and goes, well, if I could just get another boat. There is no problem with his ability. He is able. He is able. Nothing will stop him from going out to his disciples Not even stormy seas. He walks on them like nothing. So you and I cry out. We know he doesn't forget. We know he's not unable. So he's not saying, I'm trying to help. This is just too heavy. I'm trying to help. I I, I just, I, I can be here with you and commiserate, but no, none of that happens. There's a purpose. And so you cry out and you say, God, why? God, why is this still going? Why is the wind still knocking me over? The storm still raging? Why is this season so long? Please, finish it. And he says, not yet. I'm not done. I'm not done. You have more to learn. You have more to grow in. You need more strengthening, and I'm doing that right now. What you need is persistence and perseverance. What you need is faith. What you need is to trust in me. And I'm working that now.
So what was the purpose of this storm? What was the purpose for these disciples at this time? They needed to learn that what they needed was Jesus in the boat. They couldn't go to him, but he would come to them. They weren't alone. You know, I thought about this. They weren't alone in the boat. You know what they had banging around their feet the entire time? Twelve baskets full of bread. All the surplus from the season prior. Now, it doesn't say that. I'm assuming they didn't throw it overboard. I'm assuming it was in there. And even if I'm wrong and my assumption is wrong, they could at least remember, hey, a couple of hours ago, remember how he supernaturally provided bread? What's fresh in the mind of these disciples? He always provides. He always takes care. He always does what he says he's going to do. He's bigger than this storm, no matter how big it is. Jesus even says, knock, seek, ask. And what what does he tell his disciples when they cry out to him? If I'm not busy, I'll come and answer. If it's not too hard, I may make my way over to help. If I feel like it, no, he says, seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. No matter how big that storm, Jesus is bigger. You must just put your trust in him. No matter how long the storm rages, it has a purpose. It's doing something. What you need is Jesus, not simply calm seas, not a well-supplied boat with life rafts, emergency supplies, so on your own you can weather all the storms. No, you need to cry out to him to step into the boat. One interesting point of this, and again, it's fleshed out by some of the other gospel approaches to this, and it says it here, he didn't walk directly to the boat. He was walking past it. It actually specifically says it in Mark. He meant to pass the boat. In other words, as he's walking, he's like, what's up, guys? And he's going past. What? 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 Why? Why would he do that? He knows their struggle. He knows their suffering. He knows the hardships are taking place. He knows they can't make it. It's not like they just need to put their back into it a little bit more. Why? That they would cry out to him. That's why. That's the lesson they had to learn. Cry out to him. If you're not a believer today, if you're not even a Jesus follower yet today, the same is true for you. You must cry out to him. You must cry out to him. And, this, and what will happen is not just that all the storms will be calm for you for the rest of your days, but you will have Christ in your boat for all of the rest of the storms. You're a sinner deserving of judgment He came to live a perfect life and died on a cross for your sins. If you believe in him, you will have eternal life. And as he raised, so will you. This is our charge for you. Repent. Repent. Turn from your sins. Turn in faith to Christ. And not so that you will have a a nice, simple life with no struggles. No. So that you will have the creator of the universe with you no matter what you face. The Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians 4, 12 through 13, I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And I'm going to add here, the stormy seas and the clear skies, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Let's pray. Father, I am so aware of faces that come to mind right now Brothers and sisters, I know right now, in this church and elsewhere even, Lord, who are in prolonged seasons of hardship in some category of life, some category, we pray together, we cry out to you together, and Father, sometimes these things just continue to persist, continue to go on, and it doesn't seem like there's some big sin that's not been repented of, it doesn't seem like there's some obvious error that's not been corrected that you're trying to alert us to, but Lord, it just relentlessly keeps coming and we cry out, Lord, end this, end this, end this, and you haven't. Father, I pray that you would give us the faith, the trust to know you are working all of things, all of these things out for our good, for our benefit. Father, that we can consider it joy in some way, even though the circumstances aren't joyful. That when we face trials of many kinds, that we should see those things as working for something. 
to produce in us steadfastness. Father, it is it's undeniable to me that for us to remain believers in this life, in this crazy age, for us to stay faithful and steadfast, uh, to trust in your word, to do the things you told us to do. God, to be a church in Utah, to survive in Utah, to plant new churches in Utah that will then survive. For those things to happen, we have to be steadfast. We have to learn the lessons of endurance and perseverance. God, the way you teach us those lessons is by bringing us through the storms. Father, last on my heart and mind right now is the the promise that you've given us through the Apostle Paul. You told the Corinthian church, Lord, that, that no temptation has seized you except that which is common to man, but God is faithful. He would not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. Lord, what a great promise that when the temptation to distrust in you, the temptation to bail out of the ship and call it over, the temptation to, to forsake the ministry and mission that you called us to gets so heavy that we are about to give up, that we will be reminded, you have supplied all that we need because you've supplied us your son. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.